The Michelle Traconis trial is about ready to enter its sixth week. I can't believe I'm even saying that out loud. It's sixth week. And uh, there's been a lot of evidence that was presented last week in its fifth week of the trial, including DNA evidence and the interview with Pavel, who is Fotis Doulis's former employee who has been completely roped up into what he refers to as a circus. Man, there's a lot to cover in today's episode. Mover Nation, we are back after a Super Bowl Sunday hiatus. I'm Collier Landry. Let's get into it. Testimony continued today in the most notorious criminal trial. In when I was 12 years old, my testimony sent my father to prison for murdering my mother. I decided at an early age that our trauma should not be what defines us. It's what we choose to do with it that does. I'm here to share my unique perspective on true crime, mental health, society, and popular culture, albeit with a slight sense of humor. I'm Collier Landry, and welcome to my show. Mover Nation, what is going on? I am just reading some of your comments. Illegally Red says, hey, just a thought. Anyone else ever think about, think maybe that a member perk could be what true crime topic will be upcoming so we can watch before the podcast. I think that's a fabulous idea. I think that's a fabulous idea. Karen Kozlowski, it was a bummer with that the 49ers lost, but like, what a game. I mean, come on. If you're going to go out in that fashion, at least you went out in that fashion. Hey, look, Mover Nation, thank you so much. Wherever you may be and however you may be listening or watching, thank you for making me part of your day. This is the podcast where I am the show, where I cover and share with you my unique perspective on true crime, mental health, society, and popular culture, albeit with a slight sense of humor. And we have a few housekeeping things that I want to get over. I want to talk about today. So Mover Nation, we are expanding. Every week we are expanding. We just had a Patreon member come in at the top tier, pay for the year, so she gets a free t-shirt. Stacy Face, a.k.a. Stacy Massey. And is this Stacy Massey that I went to high school with that is just literally joined Mover Nation? Maybe you'll get two t-shirts, Stacy Massey, if you're even watching. Um, I greatly appreciate it. All your support helps keep the lights on, helps keep me doing this channel. And I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Welcome to new YouTube members. We have the boss lady who has rejoined for six months. Congratulations. Donna, new members. Donna Donald, Sharita Hall. Carolyn Ciano, Beach Bree, and Jay. Thank you so much for joining at the mover level. At the mover level, I greatly appreciate it. Your support is what makes all this possible. Um, some additional housekeeping notes, just because this has been brought up in the chat. Um, so look, this is a safe place for everyone to express their opinion, no matter what side you might be on, no matter what you think about the topic that I'm talking about. All perspectives are welcome here. However, what is not welcome is hate speech or doxing of individuals or going after other members in the chat or excessive spamming. Those are big no-nos. Some of our mods will put the rules up in a second, but those are things. This is a respectful community and we, we respect all walks of life, red, blue, anywhere in between, you know, just let's keep it safe. Let's keep it cordial because I, one of the biggest things that I think that is missing in a lot of current conversations is the fact that we are still having conversation and listening to one another it is a key part of us evolving as a society, as a healthy society, as health, healthy citizens of the world. As long as we're in conversation, there's always a dialogue. And if we can keep it really cool and really respectful, I would appreciate that. Other members appreciate that too. So that's my, uh, that's my little boop of the day. Uh, we are covering the Traconis uh, trial, which has entered its sixth week. And I got to tell you, the more I dive into this, the, um, the more, the more complex it appears to be. Six weeks. I mean, look, the Jennifer Crumley trial just literally crumbled and ended. And uh, that seemed to be, you know, pretty much open and shut. Boom. This trial is very complex and I don't, I still don't know what to think of it because I can't get over the fact that there's a massive, that, you know, Michelle Traconis is literally listening with earphones because everything is being translated into Spanish. And 
I'll tell you something. Trying to translate uh, English to Spanish can be very difficult. However, if you are interested, did you know that one in five Americans have learned a new language on their New Year's resolution list? I want to tell you guys about today's show sponsor, Aura, and we'll be right back. Hey, movers. Did you know that one in five Americans has learned a new language on their bucket list? If you're one of them, make 2024 the year you finally check it off with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Designed by over 150 language experts, Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are your passport to speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Real people, real conversations, that's the Babbel way. Babbel's tips and tools are not just lessons. They're companions in real-life situations. The approachable, accessible content is delivered through conversation-based teaching, ensuring you're ready to shine in the real world. Before Babbel, I couldn't imagine effortlessly ordering food, asking for directions, or chatting with local merchants, and all without consistently checking a language app while I'm on vacation. But Babbel makes it easy, providing the practical skills you need for real-life scenarios. Struggling with pronunciation? Babbel's got your back with speech recognition technology, helping. Oh, look at that. <laughs> that just completely cut off. Um, okay, so um, in the comments and below, make Babbel your year of language mastery with Babbel and receive 55% off your Babbel subscription to be a better you. One language at a time. Rules and restrictions apply. That's www.babbel.com forward slash Collier. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com forward slash Collier to get your subscription today. Okay. Um, <laughs> wow, that was really funny. I was like, That's, uh, that ad seems kind of short. Um, welcome again. Um, and I, I love how I segued into that. But no, seriously, one of the things. Oh, look at this. Tina Luffman, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, the super sticker and, um, thank you for the Martin Luther King quote. That is, um, that is absolutely fabulous when we are keeping in mind our rules in the chat. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Um, and I was like, is it Dr. Martin Luther King day today? I don't know. Um, so I have a few summaries that I want to go over because this trial is just literally, uh, it's fascinating, but it is also a massive amount of overload for information. And I can't help but wonder, and I would love to hear what you guys think about this in the chat, but I cannot help but wonder if the jury is confused as the rest of us are. Um, the, specifically, I was listening to this DNA evidence that they were going over, and we're going to play a little clip from uh, Stanford Local News that talked about this in a covering of the trial last week. But they introduced um, some of the uh, they introduced some of the DNA evidence that had been found on in the truck and on the clothes and the matches with Michelle Traconis and somebody who I had interviewed with my other podcast that I do Survivor Squad with Tara Newell. We interviewed um, Amanda Knox, who was literally convicted for um, for the murder of her roommate Meredith Ferber. And then, um, or sorry, yeah, Ferber. Um, and she was um, then acquitted by an Italian court. I mean, the whole thing, what a like media fiasco. But ultimately, she was rightfully acquitted and everything that I've seen. I've watched a lot of documentaries because they, because they also convicted someone for the murder. I'm sorry, Mer Meredith Ketcher, or Kircher is her name. Sorry, Ferber. Kircher, my apologies to her and her family. Meredith Kircher is the woman who the young woman whose life was lost uh and was ultimately uh killed by the gentleman who went to prison uh was convicted for the crime but her and her boyfriend but one of the things that they went through was this extensive dna just and i oftentimes and i was gonna grab the file from my father's trial um the newspaper clippings um because i wanted to discuss uh, I wanted to kind of look back and see what kind of DNA evidence was presented because that was one of the things that didn't really come up in my father's trial because his, you know, everything was just, he was just caught red handed by me, of course. And, um, but I think about how this, um, how this DNA 
is just so convoluted. And so one of the things when, when talking to Amanda Knox and watching some documentaries about her before our interview was how the knife was a murder weapon in her particular case. And it had her DNA and it had other individuals DNA and it had the two other roommates that were their DNA on it, but it's how they frame the DNA and how much of it is on there because our DNA floats everywhere. It's coming off of our skin and it gets on everything all the time. And one of the things that they're very, they we're very focused in this, uh, in this line of questioning and presentation to the jury this past week was these, uh, is Michelle Traconis's DNA on paper towels and on trash bags and how if you had a trash bag and you yanked it, but if you pulled it from another, like how much DNA is on there? And it also involves other people's DNA as well. So I'm thinking as all this is playing back and I'm just thinking as a lay person that doesn't really understand this, how confusing is this? And her, her attorney speaks to the media about this. And I want to play this clip for you guys because I think this is pretty is pretty interesting. Um, thank you so much. Nice hair. We're going darker because it keeps getting lighter in the sunshine. So I appreciate that, Sarah Holman. Uh, I appreciate it. Yes. Um, so DNA wasn't uh, what it is to, uh, it is today back then. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And so they've done it. They did a couple of different, um, they did a couple of different, um, they didn't know call your reversed, reversed the image because I noticed just to answer your question, illegally read. I noticed that when I was looking at the screen, my eyes were going this way off screen instead of on screen to where the material has been presented. And I figured out how to flip it around. So <laughs> that's why that is why the room has not been switched the camera has been flipped around because that way I can look and I'm reading your, this should be the right side of frame and I'm reading your comments. So it's all just, it, it was making me crazy because it wasn't symmetrical. And I'm thinking as I'm watching things, my eyes are looking away from you guys and they should be looking towards the material I'm presenting. So um, that, that hopefully answers your question, maybe a little bit TMI, but that is why I did not flip the room around. So um, I want to play this little clip from NBC Connecticut. I'm going to share my screen. There we go. That's what I want. And we're going to talk about it. Almost overnight, she went from a possible witness to a person of interest in the case of a missile divorce battle. The stuff you were throwing out, we have. And it's all Jennifer. It belongs to Jennifer. Do you understand? Turned high I'm going to talk about some of her interrogations or three interviews because they are very interesting. taking you inside the trial of Michelle Traconis. And thanks for joining us once again for Inside the Trial of Michelle Traconis to some of the key findings of the DNA analysis done on the Albany Avenue evidence and the Toyota Tacoma. So, this is the Albany Avenue evidence, which is this, which is the stuff that you see in the surveillance video of the Ford Raptor that uh, Fotis Doulos was driving and that he cut, gets out and he's tossing things into different waste receptacles along Albany Avenue. This is what this is regarding. Kristen Maydell from the state forensics lab back on the stand to lay out what was and what was not found on samples sent to the lab. Now this testimony lets the jury in on what we already knew through the arrest warrant for Michelle Traconis. You can see the left uh, on the left there are pieces of evidence Thank you so much, in the Catalyst middle, Catalyst. the results of that testing. Most of the DNA results were consistent with Jennifer Dulos. So again, as she said, most of the DNA results were were um, a match to Jennifer Dulos and Fotis Dulos. So it's, it's interesting. Again, the complex thing with this case, the complex thing is the fact that the main suspect, the main person that should be on trial, took his own life. So he can't be here to answer for the crime. So this feels so much like a trial by proxy. Um, I just can't, I can't, I can't exclude that from my mind. I can't disregard that because every time I listen to anything about this case, I start thinking, why is she on trial? She's not the person that did X, Y, and Z. She's, 
she she is did she cover things up well we're gonna find out right did she do you know was she how involved was she and that's a big problem for me is because i feel that the person that should be answering for most of this is no longer with us so that is a that is a, a big issue that I have with this particular trial. Um, I'm sure a lot of you feel the same way. Two DNA matches and some fingerprints of Fotis Dulos and then two swabs from garbage bags were consistent with Michelle Traconis. Her attorney insisting, though, that the amount of his client's DNA found was minuscule. The suggestion that her DNA was all over these items is therefore, in my view, not borne out. Our Kevin Geis is live outside of Stanford Superior Court once again. And Kevin, we are coming off of a dense day of DNA testimony. Any idea what the jury is set to see next? Absolutely. Well, to borrow a phrase from the judge himself, the prosecutors aren't going to show their hand at all during this case. But we have learned from the attorney of Pavel Gunyeni that Pavel himself is expected to take the stand here in Stanford today. Now, we know from a prior statement that he's looking forward to getting this testimony over with so he can go back to focusing on his work and his family. But first, let's talk a little bit about that DNA evidence. Uh, for the first time, the jury heard about DNA coming from the defendant, Michelle Traconis, Kristen Maydell from the State Forensics Lab read the results of the swabbing taken from garbage bags found along Albany Avenue. The DNA profile from item 883S7 is at least 780,000 times more likely to occur if it originated from Michelle Traconis and three unknown individuals than if it originated from four unknown individuals. Now, that's that. this is where I get confused. So it, 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 generated from her and three other individuals rather than four unknown individuals. Okay. Like this, if I'm serving on a jury, this is really confusing to me because I want to go, wait, wait, what? And I understand that the jury can, can clarify this obviously not live in the courtroom, but when it enters deliberations, but this is week five, we are entering week six and they're saying that this trial is going to go well into March. So think of keeping track as a juror. Like this is something that I like when you guys always ask for my pers per perspective. And again, I am not a lawyer. I am not a psychologist. I do not work in law enforcement. I'm just a guy who's been through a lot of shit. I promise the t-shirt is coming. But that to me is like what I think about. If I was in this situation, how would I feel? If I was sitting in that jury box listening to this, what are the things that I absolutely have to keep track of? What are these lawyer games that these guys play and how are they able? Because, you know, and, and you know, as I I've talked about before, I talked about the Murdoch trial, right? And this gamesmanship that was sort of played in the courtroom, right? And how even you know, the retrial hearing, et cetera, et cetera, all of these things that, um, that Alec Murdoch brought up and the way that his lawyers and the prosecution and the, it's, it's almost like they're there to confuse people and you have to keep track of a lot of evidence as a juror. This is not an easy feat to just sit here. I, I think my head would be spinning. And when I think about this is I think anyone who is, you, you know, stands trial on something that is horrific as, as uh, facing murder charges or someone or, or an accomplice to murder. I think these things are, um, are, are very serious. And the fact that, that, this sort of legal maneuvering and confusion can take place because we're not talking, we're talking about members of the general public. We're not talking about people. There may be people with PhDs, but it's not like they're going out and looking for people with like PhDs and top, the highest levels of education to serve on these juries. These are just lay people. I mean, there's nothing wrong with them, but I'm saying that the level of as someone who has a level of significant education in their life, this is confusing to me. <laughs> This is very confusing to me. I would have a really hard time keeping track of it, let alone if I'm thinking about like, I got to cook dinner for my, for the kids. I got to get the kids in bed before eight. They got to wake up in the morning. Did they do their homework? But think about all the things that are going through these jurors minds. And then they got to keep track of this nonsense. 
that's what I think is just gets very convoluted. I'd love to hear what you guys think. The lab about also it. did an analysis on a new DNA profile collected from Michelle Traconis last year in 2023 and using a new kit. The results were consistent with the analysis done in 2019. The amount of DNA, though, a sticking point for the defense. Schoenhorn had the DNA expert check the math, calculating just how little the amount was. If a 0. 0.420 nanogram, that equals 420 picograms, correct? Correct. And that 5% of 420 is the number is 21 picograms, correct? Correct. And that you already indicated is approximately three human skin cells, right? Approximately, yes. And therefore, to do that math, that would be the equivalent of 21 trillionths of one gram, correct? Correct. Okay, so it's pretty small. Very small, yes. 21 trillionths of one gram. 21 trillionths. So if a if a million is a thousand thousand and a billion is a thousand million, then a trillion must be a thousand billion. <laughs> That's just to put it in context for you. Now, the source of that DNA isn't something that the lab is able to test for unless they do a confirmatory blood test. But on this item, they did not do that confirmatory blood test. Shannon. All right. Yeah, Attorney Schoenhorn, again, uh, quick to point out the differences between what was laid out in that arrest warrant and what the expert testifies was actually found during her examination. Now, Kevin, the prosecution and the defense both throwing out scenarios for how that DNA may have gotten there. Attorney Sean McGinnis asked Maydell about a statement Draconis made in her third interview, which the jury has not yet seen. The defendant in her third interview with police indicated to them that she held a bag open for Mr. Dulos as he deposited something in the bag. Is it possible that her DNA could have gotten on the bag as she was holding it? Yes, that's that's possible. You, We know that if you come in contact with something, it is possible for you to leave your own, own DNA behind on an item. Now, on cross-examination, attorney John Schoenhorn posed his own hypotheticals about how... Like, this, is, this is what I think is just really fascinating with all of this. Um, but we're going to get into something that's way more fascinating than this DNA. But I think this is just so convoluted when I look at this. Like, how do you do the math? Legally read. Mind blown. Exactly. Like, one trillionth. Seven, 21 trillionths of one gram. Um, that's insane. How his client's DNA may have gotten onto that bath. If a person were to pull a garbage bag out of a roll and put their hand to prevent the next one from pulling out, so you pull it off one, would that, would that uh, scenario be consistent with leaving some DNA on the next bag? If your bare hand is coming in contact with an item, yes, it's possible that you can leave DNA behind. If Ms. Traconis was in a truck and a truck with a... Uh, another contributor, such as Mr. Dulos, touching either the seat or the hand of Mr. Dulos, and then he were to then deposit a garbage bag into a uh, receptacle, would that also be consistent with a manner in which trans that, her, that, uh, that her DNA could be transferred to the exterior of such bag? Secondary transfer can can occur if just so many factors um, contribute to that. We don't know if the person is a shedder. That makes a big difference for that initial transfer of DNA. If you transfer more DNA to someone's hand, then there's a better chance that that DNA will then transfer to that other object. And with okay. So if they're a shedder, right? So is it like dandruff? Like you use like, you know, uh, what is it, not just for men, head and shoulders, and you put that in and there's no dandruff flakes? That's my point. And so this is to me, like nobody's denying that she was in the truck. She is on video in the truck. No one is denying. She's saying, I held open the bag and he threw stuff in it. No one's denying that. I understand if DNA evidence comes into play, if you're like, nope. I was never in the house. I was never in the truck. I have no idea what you're talking about. I have, I have never been to the state of Connecticut. I am from Venezuela. I don't know who any of these people were. Boom, you find their DNA 
in large amounts in a house and in a truck and in this and that. It's like, okay, you're not telling the truth. But she's already saying, well, yeah, I, she, I was opening bags. I was in the truck. You see me on the video in the truck. I'm in the Starbucks with him. We had an intimate relationship. This is what I think is so interesting and why I, I personally, again, do not quite understand how evidence like, like, what is a jury supposed to take away from this, right? Like, what is a jury supposed to look at this and say, oh, this tells me a lot, right? Again, as I was saying, she said 72 trillionths, right? Or uh, 27 trillionths or whatever it was, 21 trillionths, you know, so a thousand, thousand, million, a thousand, million, billion, a thousand, billion, trillion, right? Times 21, right? You think about this just, this is very complex math, right? The, the just it's microscopic, right? It's less than microscopic. It's almost like at the cellular level that that this DNA is is a single cell of DNA is appearing. You would think so, but the way that they the way that they present this and the prosecution presents it, like how is the jury supposed to to know what it is? And again, if she says, "I was never in the truck. I was never around him. I don't know who the who the hell he is." I, I've never been in any of this. I don't know who she is. That's one thing because then you can catch and be like, well, then why is your DNA in the house? Why is your DNA on her clothes? Why is your DNA on this? Again, it's one of these things. That, and as I was saying before with the Amanda Knox thing, when watching that documentary, they talk a lot about the DNA on the knife and how it had DNA from everyone else. And this is how she was exonerated was the amount of DNA was so small compared to the person who was actually convicted for the murder, who actually admitted to killing the woman. She, she this gentleman whose name escapes me right off the top of my head, he volumes of DNA compared to Amanda Knox's DNA compared to anyone else that lived in the house's DNA. So the way that these things are manipulated by the prosecution, it, it, it call, it, for me, it calls into question a lot of this. And again, this is speaking from my own personal perspective. I believe in the American justice system. I have a very positive experience with the American justice system. I still think it's the best in the world. It has worked for me. I believe that it works, but it does make you take pause at how these facts are presented in a court of law to a jury that doesn't know any better. They don't know anything about science or DNA or physics. And yes, as you said, Cynthia, and today is, today is your physics lesson right there. We're doing a little bit of math, doing a little bit of physics lessons, civics lessons, lessons on how to behave, sense of decorum, all kinds of things. But in all seriousness, this is something to me that, that I feel that is just very confusing and you know and her defense lawyer in a second he's going to talk to the media and he's going to just say this is essentially bullshit speech subsequent so kevin what is the jury supposed to make of all of these scenarios it sounds like really any of the ways that mcginnis or schoenhorn explained how her dna could have gotten there are possible according to madel's testimony and i should mention uh, the jury hasn't even heard yet about potentially what investigators say happened at the mountain spring property before they went to albany avenue so they're just kind of laying the groundwork it sounds like for how this could have all played out Absolutely. The jury had a chance to hear uh, quite a bit. So many hypotheticals at one point that the Judge Kevin Randolph actually had to rein them in. Uh, ultimately, the jury has to sort of determine for themselves um, which theory they're willing to buy more into or continue to hear more testimony, both from the state and the defense. Of course, the easiest way the defense could clear it up would be to put Michelle Traconis on the stand herself. But John Schoenhorn has not indicated one way or another if he and the client are willing to do that. Uh, Kevin, we've been waiting to hear uh, I mean, a big part of all this, the forensic evidence found on the Toyota Tacoma that may connect the vehicle to the crime and an alleged cleanup. It wasn't much compared to what was found along Albany Avenue, but one finding could be significant to the state's case. We're talking about those seats which were removed from the Toyota Tacoma and then handed over to police 
by Dulos's four group employee, Pavel Gumiani. Investigators testified about taking a cutting from the seat cover of a spot that had a positive result of a blood screening test that was never confirmed as blood. Now, Maydell testified that it was consistent with Jennifer Dulos's DNA. Now, assuming one individual, the DNA profile from item 86S1 is at least. Now, this makes sense to me. This, this is a this DNA makes complete sense. But again, what does that have to do with Michelle Traconis? That's my question. They're establishing that, and this is Toyota Tacoma. I'm a Tacoma owner myself. Great trucks. This Toyota Tacoma. It seems like everyone who works in construction or who uses a truck has a Toyota Tacoma. But that's a whole other day, a whole other topic for a whole other day. They're fabulous trucks. But her DNA being on the seat of of Jennifer Dulos, her DNA, and this truck, which was then detailed by Fotis Dulos and given back to his employee, right? That all makes sense. But again, Fotis Dulos is not on trial here. Michelle Traconis is on trial. It just feels to me that there is, again, trial by proxy in a lot of ways. Trial by proxy because you just for for Michelle Traconis to and I understand and, and something that I explained at the beginning of this which is based on my research is that the charge of conspiracy to commit murder and covering it up carries with it the same the same uh, sentence as the actual murder which in the state of Connecticut is 60 years she's facing a tremendous amount of time for this to me this feels like again like how you know and, and i'm going to get into her the conflicting statements in her three different statements that she gave to law enforcement but to me this feels a lot like trial by proxy it really does and i know that a a, a mother a woman has lost her life but this just seems at least a hundred billion times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing billion. of the electric toothbrush than if it originated from an unknown individual. Now, investigators believe that Fotis Dulos used Pavel Gumenius Tacoma to drive down to New Canaan the morning Jennifer disappeared. He killed her down there, they say, and then drove back that truck to Farmington. Jennifer's body, as you know, has never been found. And while that cutting did have DNA on it, the rest of the swabbings taken from the Tacoma did not generate any DNA profiles. That includes swabbings taken from the door and the license plate, screws, and washers. Attorney Sean McGinnis asked Maydell about what would cause DNA to be removed from an item. How, if at all, could a car being detailed impact potential DNA evidence found in the car? Well, as of any wiping or cleaning that we talked about before that can remove any DNA that may be left behind or any biological material. And could that also potentially prevent DNA profiles from being generated on objects tested? Correct. We wouldn't have enough DNA to be detected, therefore would not generate a profile. So, Kevin, clearly the state here hammering home that point that the Tacoma was washed, it was detailed, it was thoroughly cleaned, and that is why they didn't find any sort of significant DNA inside the vehicle. The cleaning of the Tacoma is something the prosecution alleges that Traconis allegedly helped play a role in and actually led, ending up leading to her second arrest, right? Right. We heard multiple times about sort of the cleaning of the Tacoma, how clean the Tacoma was from Matthew Riley back when he testified about how much uh, he was pulling out of the Tacoma and how uh, little there was to actually pull out of the Tacoma. Uh, so we've heard about the cleaning multiple times, and that's actually somewhere inside the warrant where they, the prosecutors pull Michelle Traconis into this entire uh, scheme, let's call it. So they continue to pull Michelle Traconis in through uh, the cleaning of the Tacoma, and we're expected to hear more about the cleaning of the Tacoma today and in future testimony. Yeah, and Michelle Tracona is telling those investigators that Fotis Dulos had told her he was cleaning spilled coffee out of the Tacoma. So uh, more to hear on that. Let's go back to the cut. Okay, so here's the thing. Hey, babe, 
I spilled some coffee in my truck. I got to go take it to the, 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 get to the car wash. Can you help me out with that? Sure, babe. Sounds good. Can we go to Starbucks? Cause you know, like they like to go to Starbucks. Can we go to Starbucks? I'm not saying she's innocent and I'm not saying that she didn't know about this, but I am saying <laughs> that it is very interesting when you think about this with Michelle Traconis and her involvement, like it just really feels like they're reaching. You do get a sense of the fact that maybe she was not as, because also again, we have to remember our good sponsors Babel, but she was someone whose first language was not English. And also Fotis Doulis's first language was not English either. But I don't think he spoke Spanish. And I don't think she, he, she spoke either Greek or Turkish. He, his name is Turkish. I, he, I think he also has ties to Greece. Two totally different languages. <laughs> Two completely different languages. Um, so it's, uh, um, you, you know, there, there's language barriers here as well. So I just, I'm not saying she's innocent. I'm not saying she's the babe in the woods, but it does feel like the biggest missing part of all of this is Fotis Dulos. I mean, obviously, and he's not here to stand for a crime, a crime that they also don't have a body for as well. And, you know, I, I can tell you many times when I've drugged many a girlfriend down to the car wash to say, hey, let's go, let's go have a trip to, my dad used to do that with his mistress. I remember because I was there with him when we went and did a car wash thing. Guys love to do that. I'm not somebody who washes my car very much, to be honest. I'm not the best, but whatever. It doesn't matter. Because uh, I don't want anybody breaking into it and think it's nice. Um, but I, I think that, you know, I, but many times I've driven down, you know, have my girlfriend, hey, just come help me. We're going to vacuum it out. We're going to do this. You know, I, 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 I <laughs> it is very difficult. It is, it is very, it is very easy to wrap your mind around that she might not have been as aware as the prosecution wants to make it out to be, or as we would like to think that she was aware of enough that this that she could have had something to do with this. Um, anyways, uh, let's get, let, so let me go over what she had because in her, in her interview, she talks about this. Um, she talks about this, uh, this particular in her third police interview. So she had indicated. So during the first two interviews with Michelle Traconis, she repeatedly told investigators that she had been cleaning windows while at 80 mountain spring road during the third interview. However, she said that she had been cleaning bathrooms. So she indicated that when Pavel Gumini, uh, Gumini arrived at the residence at approximately 5 PM, she and Dulos had been standing up against the Toyota Tacoma passenger side she said, quote, Fotis and I were against the car, the Tacoma. Fotis was like behind me, like physical contact. Pavel arrives. I think Pavel or Fotis says I didn't see anything or we weren't doing anything. I think something like a joke, unquote. When asked to explain her meaning, she answered like, yeah, we were making dot, dot, dot. Traconis appeared to be saying that Gemini's arrival interrupted uh, um, Fotis and Traconis from engaging in intimate acts alongside the passenger side of the Toyota Tacoma. So Traconis told investigators that she was inside the house when Fotis came looking for paper towels because he had, quote, spilled something in the Tacoma. Supposedly, he went outside to clean out the spilled coffee and then returned to her and handed her the paper towel, which she threw in the garbage. She explained that Fotis had said he spilled, I think it was coffee. When asked where he spilled it, she responded, in the in in one of the cars that's what he told me i'm not sure if that's true or not but the paper towel was dirty draconis in, indicated the used paper towel had a brown had been brown in color she also told investigators that the soiled paper towel did not smell like coffee interesting um so again 
the whole concept to me of being the um anna butts thank you so much for uh, anita butts thank you so much for becoming a channel member i greatly appreciate it um thank you so much dom's mom for lurking appreciate that um so again um this whole situation with um with michelle traconis does feel again very um very strange and and very very contrived if you will that she has um been again why are we not interviewing photos Dulos? why are we not putting him on trial because he's not here so we need the next best thing which is of course <laughs> michelle traconis this is just what I find is very, very interesting to me. Let's see what. So I want to get into where the uh, where her um, her attorney speaks. Cutting from the Tacoma seats that had DNA from Jennifer Dulos on it. Is there any reason that she would be in the Toyota Tacoma that belonged to Pavel Gumini? Not that we know of at this point. We're expecting uh, to hear a little bit from Pavel Gumieni himself today. So if there was any sort of relationship between the two, if they knew each other, we know uh, Pavel Gumieni was an employee of Fotis Dulos for a long time, even predating the divorce itself. Uh, so if there was any sort of relationship there, it's likely that prosecutors and the defense uh, would bring up any sort of relationship, uh, especially the defense, if they're trying to prove the point that Jennifer Dulos had a reason to be inside that Toyota Tacoma. But I would expect prosecutors to likely bring that up first. Yeah, we have heard again. Well, he was a uh, four group employee. He was also a family friend. Jennifer would often ask him for help around the house with, with certain items and certain things that she needed help with. Now, all of these pieces of evidence were also compared to samples from the nanny, Lauren Almeida, and the Dulos children, as well as Pavel Gumieni. And when it comes to him, there was a bit of a surprise in the DNA findings. In comparing the mitochondrial DNA profile from 88 dash one dash one s two dash zero one and the known from 94 number submission number 94 which is pavel's known are the same therefore pavel gumini or another member of the same maternal lineage cannot be excluded as the source of item so for the very first time we have now heard that a hair recovered from a sponge found in the evidence dumped along albany avenue matched the profile of pavel gumini a mitochondrial DNA is not like nuclear DNA. Nuclear DNA is unique to an individual, whereas mitochondrial DNA is not. Nucleal DNA versus mitochondrial DNA. So I don't know, for those of you that took biology, uh, when you were in high school, we learned about mitochondria and the nuclei of the actual, um, uh, of the cellular of cells and nucleus i mean this is just all again very 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 confusing and very Horn had this to say about the discovery how um pavel's pavel gumieni's uh hair got in onto a scrubber sponge found inside one of those bags but um or at least you know maybe it's his mother's hair i don't know so it's unclear how that hair would have gotten there, Kevin. And we're expecting, again, Gumiani's testimony sometime today. And there, Kevin, hey, one of, uh, no, hair, just back mitochondrial back. DNA, nuclear DNA, tail of Pavel Gumiani. A mitochondrial DNA is not like nuclear DNA. Nuclear DNA is unique to an individual, whereas mitochondrial DNA is not. Schoenhorn had this to say about the discovery. So again, <laughs> if he was if photos Julius was cleaning out the truck why is so if this is pavel gamini's truck why if his dna was somehow involved in on this sponge that was used to clean out the truck his own truck of course his dna would be on there that's what again one of those things that i don't feel makes any sense to me um i don't feel it makes any sense to me so um this <laughs> this is something uh that again this very convoluted dna evidence and again this mystery man not being here to be to be able to be put on trial in the first place is all very concerning to me that's for sure how um
testimony sometime today. Again, so, we know that Dracovis is a family is upset jump that he was granted immunity in the case. We heard about that during those suppression hearings. Uh, so, Kevin, does it look like or seem like that Attorney John Schoenhorn is implying that Gumieni may have had more involvement than we've originally heard or what's originally been reported by investigators? Of course, his job is to create this reasonable doubt for the jury. Right. Reasonable doubt is a whole part of the defense. It's really his main job as the defense attorney. So we're expecting him to continue to sort of push a little bit of reasonable doubt on the jury as far as finding Pavel Gumieni's hair on that sponge uh, that was located on Albany Avenue in Hartford. When I was able to contact uh, Pavel's attorney, Lindy Urso, yesterday, he did tell me uh, that that's something that isn't necessarily super shocking to him, though that was the first time he was hearing about the hair that was found on the sponge. But he believes there's a perfectly logical explanation, and it will come up in testimony today. Wow. And we know that Lindy Urso, uh, Kevin, has represented Pavel Gumini for years now. So interesting to hear that this is the first time that he has learned that. Again, the jury is now aware of just how much of Jennifer's DNA was found on what was dumped in those trash cans along Albany Avenue. You'll remember they saw the bloody Vineyard Vine shirt and cut bra during one of the hardest, most emotional days in the trial so far. And so the, for those of you that don't know that this was th this particular um, vine and vineyard shirt, very designer size, extra small shirt. That was hers was one of those things that were found in the trash cans on Albany Avenue, which you see photos Dulos dropping these th items into these waste receptacles on the side of the street. Really just really sad because again, there is no body. So this is, a lot of the evidence that they believed, you know, shows that she was murdered. So, um, Hey, court McNeil, call your Landry show. What is this? <laughs> uh, what is this? Uh, uh, I see, uh, YouTube YouTuber, uh, here, call your Landry show. Uh, what is this? <laughs> Interesting. Um, Somebody can fill me in on that. Oh, it's Karen. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I, that got me very confused. I thought I had an imposter just like step into the to the channel chat. I'm like, oh, did somebody create a... I guess I should, probably should create another channel. <laughs> um, okay, so let's get into this Pavel um, Gawini, uh, or Gamini, his testimony, right? So he... Um, he was somebody who worked for Photos Dulos and he was um Pavel. So Pavel claims that Photos Dulos uh had Photos Dulos had um told him not to talk to police due to the fact that he has a green card. So again, this is something that obviously people who are um people who are um people who are um you know, here in the country or whose immigration status is in limbo. Um, they are, they are very, um, you know, nervous about dealing with law enforcement. You know, immigration is a big deal in this country. So a lot of times when they're fearing of their immigration status or a green card, they don't want to be like involved in any sort of police activity whatsoever, which I would say is one way that obviously photos doulos probably used um Pavel uh, Gemini to um probably use him and manipulated him uh because of his green card status uh because your green card can be revoked at any time um and you get it for 5 years but you can you you get any brush ins with the law it, it, you know it's DHS Department of Homeland Security Immigration Enforcement IC uh, they can take your, they can remove your green card status and, and, and kick you out of the country like that. And I believe he was married and had children, by the way. So doesn't want to do anything to upset the apple cart. So he would have been probably willing to go along with anything that Fotis may have manipulated him for, because he'd be like, I'll just, I'll just report you to immigration or I'll get your, I'll put your green card status in jeopardy. Um, because you have to be in this country for 10 years to get immigration, to get, to become a legal citizen in the United States. So you have to, um, you have to, uh, you know, in a lot of ways feel for this guy, Pavel, because it sounds like he's just been thrown in, as he says, thrown into the circus and the circus is over. So 
Pavel provided multiple voluntary inter inter interviews with investigators, um, and he has never been charged in any of this. Police seized his phone, and that analysis indicated that web history searches and call logs were all deleted. When he when asked about the del deletions, um, Gemeni vehemently denied deleting anything from his phone. It was noted that on May 28, 2019, Fotis Dulos physically had possession of Pavel's cell phone in order to, quote, check his call history. The web history since the earliest date was tw August 28, 2017, up to May 27, 2019, was deleted. Searches from April 2nd, 2019, up to May 27th, 2019, were deleted with ones prior to April 2nd, 2019, were sporadically deleted. Anything after May 30th, 2019, was still there. The call logs from May 25th, 2019 to May 26th at 7.39 PM, p.m. were deleted. The next one was timed at 7.53, was still there. So Dulos allegedly told Pavel on May 29th that he should either replace the seats in or sell the Tacoma. Pavel refused, and when he discovered the truck was washed and detailed, Dulos again insisted that he replace the seats and advised him to refer to the seats as, quote, hardware when on the phone. Again, really weird behavior. But if your boss is, you know, holding and warning you about your green card, like it's not a subtle, it's not a subtle thing to threaten someone's immigration status. You know what I mean? Like you can just say, hey, you got a green card. I, you know, you don't want to be, you don't want to be involved in any of this mess, right? He probably wants to keep his nose clean, have his kids, live his life, make his money, do his thing, not be involved in any shenanigans whatsoever. I feel for the guy. I really do. Uh, Pavel went as far, uh, went so far as to go to a junkyard in search of replacement seats, but wasn't successful, which eleven allegedly angered Fotis Dulos. Uh, Fotis Dulos. Pavel allegedly asked Dulos why he wanted the seats replaced, and Dulos answered. Uh, answered he gave Jennifer a hug on Mother's Day and also held her cat and was worried Jennifer's hair could be found in the truck. And she was already missing at that time. On May the 30th, 2019, Fotis Dulos called Gimini to tell him the media was outside his house and to come and get the Tacoma, Toyota Tacoma and park it inside the garage or take it home. He originally replaced the seats from Dulos's wrecked Porsche, but kept the Tacoma seats in his garage in case the police ever wanted to take them, unquote. So he got on the witness stand last week, and this is a quick little summary of him. So this comes from the uh, the Stanford Advocate, which is the local Connecticut paper there. It says, Traconis, it says, Traconis, um, sorry, my neighbors are outside yelling. Traconis trial testimony, end of the circus for former Dulos worker. Pavel Gamini, the former project manager at Photos Dulos's company, Four Group, testifies on the, the, the day on day 19 of the Michelle Traconis criminal trial at Connecticut, Connecticut Superior Court in Stanford, Connecticut. Traconis is now on charges related to the disappearance and death of New Canaan resident Jennifer Dulos. The slender, soft-spoken Gamini talked of how he came from his native Poland to the United States about 24 years ago and how he found work as a carpenter framing houses for a company owned by Fotis Dulos, who he met around 2004. And he spoke of a more metaphorical journey as well from his initial belief that Fotis Dulos wasn't involved to, involved to cooperating with police investigating his boss. Quote, I knew this guy for a very long time and I trusted him that he was a good guy, Gimini said. But he said that he started to change when Fotis Dulos kept pressing him to replace seats in his truck, which police believe was used in the crime. The article continues below this ad. Fotis Dulos also made another request. He said, if we talk on the phone, let's not call it, quote, seats. Gimini quoted Fotis Dulos as saying, let's call it hardware. The assistant state attorney, Sean McGinnis, asked Gimini how he felt. He said, I didn't know what to say. I was shocked. I didn't say anything. Gamini would keep the seats, eventually agreeing to testify in the case after obtaining an immunity agreement, barring him from prosecution. He offered vivid testimony detailing Fotis Dulos's, Fotis Dulos's and Traconis's interactions before and after the disappearance. 
He recalled Traconis referring to Jennifer Dulos as a bitch. I'm assuming that's what this means on at least two occasions. But Traconis's lawyer maintained after Gemini stepped down from the witness stand that the testimony was disputative and but in favor of his client. Taking the stand on the trial's 18th day last Tuesday, Gemini said he was said first he was as nervous. And, uh, he was he said as he first said he as nervous and as nervous was nervous. Sorry, they <laughs> English guys English uh, was nervous in response to a question from McGinnis before detailing his background briefly. Uh, he said he grew up in Poland uh, prior to coming to the United States in 2000, though he hadn't worked as a carpenter before. Gimini said he found work framing houses for an Avon home building business before he met Fotos Dulos. And his sister Rena was an architect, uh, an architect who had a luxury home development business of their own. He went on to work for the company full time in 2016, eventually rising to the position of project manager. And over that time, he became came to know Jennifer Dulos, as well as a couple's children, sometimes doing odd jobs around the house, like building a swing set. Uh, like, how nice, right? It seems like a nice guy. At one point, Jennifer Dulos confided in him to have a vehicle that she drove repaired without her husband knowing. He said, quote, at some point, I told her that I have to stop doing that because this is going to get me fired. So obviously he was put in the middle of these two individuals and they're very tumultuous relationship and divorce and uh, their estranged relationship. Over the same period, he said he came to know Traconis, who eventually moved into Fotis Dulos' home on Jefferson Crossing in Farmington along with their daughter. After Jennifer Dulos moved out, he said Fotis Dulos would complain about the divorce, though it didn't make him suspicious despite a conversation his boss had with a contractor about cameras at his estranged wife's New Canaan home, prompting Gimini to give his boss a warning of sorts. She can record you with anything, he recalled telling his boss. Just don't do anything stupid. Gimini said that he spent most of the day Jennifer Dulos disappeared May 24th, 2019 at a home that the Ford Group was renovating on Sturbridge Hill Road in New Canaan. Gimini drove a Ford Raptor owned by the company to the property under an arrangement which he would leave his own vehicle, a 2001 Toyota Tacoma, at Tacoma, Tacoma at Fotis Dulos' house in Farmington. But the day prior, Fotis Dulos asked Gimini to drop the truck off at a different company-owned home. Investigators believe that Fotis Dulos, who at the time had recently cut his hair to a length similar to Gimini's close crop, used the Tacoma to drive from Farmington to New Canaan to ambush his estranged wife in her Wellis Lane home. Uh, and this is him obviously pointing out the, <laughs> the truck that he owns, the Toyota Tacoma, but Gimini had trouble remembering much detail about that day. He said, because it was a work day, like any other, he was at the Sturbridge Hill road home arriving at about 10 AM. By that time, investigators believe Fotis Dulos had already killed his estranged wife at the Wells Lane home about 10 minutes away and was well underway with a crime scene cleanup prior to leaving the scene at about 10.25 a.m. at the wheel of Jennifer Dulos's Chevy Suburban. Gamini said he might have gone to a Chinese restaurant that day, but that he couldn't remember if that was that day or another day. Though Traconis' lawyer quizzed him repeatedly, uh, he had trouble remembering details about the establishment, but remained calm and poised throughout, often pausing to consider his thoughts before answering. Again, as I said, when you are a witness... <laughs> And I said this during the retrial hearing with uh, Alexander Murdoch, uh, when a witness is on the witness stand and they are composed and they are giving very matter of fact answers and not appearing perturbed and giving thought and thinking and going, no, this is how it is. And they're very confident. They're telling the truth because as someone who has testified against his father in court as a child, and people thought I was coached and people kept saying that here's the truth. When you are telling the truth, it is the easiest thing for you to remember. It's so pure it flows. Trust me. Saying and offering that information up when it is the truth is 100% on point. It, it, it just is. So, <clears throat> again, he doesn't appear rattled because he's remembering it as it is because he's telling the truth. That's just how it works. Uh, so he returned to, 
So he he said he returned to the farming to Farmington that afternoon to find photos Dulos and Traconis at another four group property property where he said they initially looked surprised to see him, but he said nothing else seemed amiss as the three jockeyed vehicles between several properties so Gamini could get his dirt bike onto his truck, which he drove home for the Memorial Day weekend. Over the ensuing days, he said he came to learn about the disappearance but didn't suspect his boss, initially thinking Jennifer Dulos might have briefly run off. Relating a story, a story to Fotis Dulos about him, told him about her doing something similar years before. My father again tried the same thing, said, oh, yes, yeah, she ran away before. My mother never ran away. Never happened. Nor were any suspicions aroused, he said, when Fotis Dulos cleaned and detailed his aging Toyota Tacoma days following the disappearance. Because, again, it's your boss. He borrowed your truck. Uh, he was being cool and like, hey, I cleaned it up for you, bro. Like, it was messy. But then again, the seats, the whole seats thing, red flag. But he said Fotis Dulos kept pressing him on the Toyota to, on the Toyota, telling him the Ford Focus bucket seats that he had put in made the 18-year-old pickup, which leaked oil and occasionally required a complicated startup process involving Gemini's house key, appeared, quote, ghetto. What does he care? A week after the disappearance, following days of pressure about the seats, Gemini said he went off on Fotis Dulos during a meeting at the company's office in Farmington. I just couldn't hold it in anymore. I Gemini said I told him. What's up with my truck? Why did you clean it? Fotis Dulos, he, he had said, smile before giving an explanation. He said, because you were never going to do it. Gimini would return the, would turn the seats over to state police when they searched the truck on June the 2nd, 2019. He would go on to provide several voluntary interviews to investigators, investigators, including an eight-hour session at Troop G in Bridgeport on July 12th, 2019. I think that what came out loud and clear is several days after the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos, both my client and Mr. Gemini assumed she was still alive, he said. As far as I'm concerned, that is certainly the dispositive factor when it comes to the charge of conspiracy to commit murder. In his own comments outside the courthouse, Gemini's lawyer, Lindy Urso, said he was thought he said he thought the defense was, quote, trying to make the most of his client's testimony but he wasn't surprised with the tactic. Quote, early on, he was talking to the police against my advice, describing Gemini as a very hardworking family man. More than anything, the lawyer said Gemini wanted this time, his time in the spotlight to end. Quote, he's a very private individual, but by the same token, we're here now, and this is the beginning of the end of the circus for him so he can get back to his life. I would say I agree with that. I really hope Pavel... Gimini, that you can get back to your life because you deserve it, man. Um, being rattled from all of this is just, yeah. Having your life turned into an upheaval by your former boss who clearly took the life of his wife and now you're roped into another trial. Five years later, five years this guy has been dealing with this. Um, this is a circus. I, I'm going to continue to cover this circus because uh, it is fascinating to me, but it is really unfortunate for everyone involved, especially for the five children. And we'll get into that in another day because I have many thoughts on that as child children who are victims of both the perpetrator and the victim themselves. And they've lost both parents and it's a very tragic, horrific situation. I want to say a big thank you to all my channel members, channel subscribers, new channel members, New Patreon subscribers, thank you all so much for uh, for everything, all your support. I greatly appreciate it. If you would not mind, on the way out, please click like. And if you like what I'm talking about, you are interested in this channel, please click subscribe. Please check out my other videos as well. In the Call Your Landry Show, my true crime stuff, my own personal true crime story, check out all the info that I have. Uh, um, I, you know, all the videos, I really, I really appreciate it. I appreciate everyone who, who showed up today. Uh, thank you all. Mover Nation, we get through another one. On that note, I'm calling your Landry. I'll see you on the next one. This podcast is made possible by support from listeners just like you. For exclusive content around this podcast, please consider supporting me via Patreon by going to callyourlandry.com forward slash support. Please subscribe via Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. And please leave us a five-star review. If you want to see video episodes of this podcast, 
please check out my YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Collier Landry. You can find links to additional resources in the show notes of today's episode. This podcast is a production of Don't Touch My Radio. Copyright Collier Landry.